Good evening and welcome to the program. Tonight we take you inside the hunt for Australia's most wanted criminal. He's a rat-cunning, ruthless gangster who's made an eye-watering fortune in porting massive quantities of drugs into Australia. Law enforcement authorities call the criminal network he helps run the Aussie Cartel. But as you'll see, after years outwitting the cops, his arrogance could soon be his downfall. We've managed to link top secret intelligence with multiple online clues, including some remarkably careless Facebook and Instagram activity to discover this crook's secret hideout. In the heart of Istanbul, Turkey, down a dark and bumpy road, lies the King's Cross Hotel. Despite its look, it's not very welcoming. And we've been told it isn't safe to film outside the car. We're here because this is the endpoint of a decade-long search. He's likely to be armed, so we need to take great precautions. Hunting for a man best known as the Facebook gangster. A criminal mastermind who's been taunting police to catch him if they can. His name is Hakan Ayik, and he's Australia's most wanted criminal. He's the latest generation of uh, a model that's been going around a long time. The flash cars, there's the guns, comes with the territory. For years, Ayik has been running Australia's most powerful drug trafficking cartel from a secret foreign location. Well, why wouldn't you be cocky if you've been making this amount of money, if you've developed a cartel of international standing and you are offshore? I mean, these people do what they do because underneath it all they think they're bulletproof and they think they'll never get arrested. Now we've found him and far from hiding, Hakan Ayik is living a flashy free life in Turkey. The search for this gangster has taken 13 years and began when Ayik was working his way up the criminal ladder in Australia. In March 2008, police officers at Jandicott Airport near Perth intercepted a light aircraft they believed was carrying illegal drugs. Seven million dollars worth of methylamphetamine and ecstasy tablets crammed in a bag in the back of this small plane. It turned out to be the biggest bust in Western Australia's history, with police intelligence eventually linking the shipment to Hakan Ayik, who at that stage was a new face in the drug trade. At the beginning, uh, looked like a Middle Eastern organised crime figure who was, who was up and coming. Uh, that's generally how they sort of appear, you know, someone jumps up as uh, more savvy, more, um, more brazen, more police aware, more difficult to catch, and they hit the radar because of that. One of the police interested in Hakan Ayik was AFP investigator Roland Singal. He says what made Ayik so successful so quickly was his brain for business, forging links with the biggest Chinese triads in the world giving him access to an endless supply of drugs. What does it tell us about Hakan Ayik back in 2008, 9 A young up-and-comer, he looks like all the other Middle Eastern crooks and barkies, yep. and yet he has the nous to reach out and form ties with what was then the biggest drug trafficking syndicate in our region. The fact that he had that awareness, the fact that he had the, uh, the wherewithal to actually develop that network, uh, was probably an unusual feature for him. Uh, means he was probably pretty savvy. Um, and for such a young person at the time. Ayik's skill was working out how to get the drugs safely into Australia. He teamed up with an old high school mate, Dax Naguru, who at the time was an enforcer for the Comanchero bikies. Hakanik has obviously had the, the smarts to realise um, Australia's a big market. If I can use the Bokki gangs as distributors, I've got a huge, I've got huge access to the Australian market uh, and huge profits that come from that. And he's now in the management team and he's directing traffic. By 2010, federal agencies were convinced Ayik was the mastermind behind multiple drug importations into Australia. 
But their investigations hit a major hurdle when Ayik vanished overseas and went on the run. So many of these gangsters say, you know, I love the gangster life, I don't care whether I live or die, I just want that flash lifestyle. But the reality is there's always the concern about the knock at the door. There's always the concern that you're going to be betrayed. There's, you're always looking over your shoulder. Veteran crime reporter John Sylvester has come face to face with some of Australia's worst criminals. He says Hakan Ayik is cunning and has a unique ability to bring together warring gangs. He's been able to organise a network which involves the Russian mafia, triads, uh, Mexican cartels, organised bikey groups. I mean, he's developed a massive illicit business and if it was on the share market, um, a lot of people would buy shares. Ayik moved his operation offshore and, confident he'd never be found, he became more brazen in the quantity of drugs he was sending to Australia. Police had some wins, but many more shipments were getting through undetected, thanks to what investigators like Roland Singer call doors. Human insiders working in our ports and airports who are willing to wave through illicit drugs for criminals. As a crime syndicate, if you have doors, it means that you can push your product through and sell it at a, at a greater price with all of that risk removed. Um, if a criminal in Australia wants to buy drugs in Thailand, uh, it'll be pretty cheap if he wants to go over there and pick it up. But if he wants it delivered to his door here, it's a value add. And if a, if a syndicate's got doors, they can charge more at the end. How is it that Hakan Ayik has so many doors? Look, it, it could be through his connections uh, to now numerous bikey groups and Middle Eastern organised crime. Uh, the Sydney waterfront's a big place. Um, the air freight and logistics business is a big place. And for a drug lord with a lot of stock to move, there are some places you want to have connections. Airports and airlines. Is Qantas compromised? In a discreet location on the outskirts of Melbourne, a former undercover agent is showing us how easy it is for criminal gangs to operate. He's buying an encrypted phone on the black market. Hey, how you going? Good, thanks. Uh... Is there any way of getting it this afternoon? It's called a cipher. It looks like a normal phone, but all activity on the device is completely encrypted, making it a must have for Australian criminals who need to avoid police detection. They're like 100% secure, encrypted, yep. um, they're untrackable, untraceable, ah. so they're not attached to any SIM, they're not attached to any name. He's directed to leave $1,600 in cash in the glove box of his unlocked car. Minutes later, a man in a black hoodie arrives to drop off the phone. There are almost 10,000 of these cipher phones in Australia, being used almost exclusively by serious organised crime. It's no surprise then that we're not the only ones tracing their use. I won't be specific about who they lead back to, but it, it certainly leads back to elements of the Aussie cartel. The boss of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, Michael Phelan, has been closely monitoring cipher phones. And while he won't say it, his commission believes wanted drug lord Hakan Ayik and the Comancheros are behind their introduction into Australia. This is the first time Phelan has given a major TV interview. Up until now, your agency has been even more secretive than ASIO. Why speak up now? From time to time, we think it's important that we talk to the public about the threats that the country is facing. At this particular point in time, um, Australia is facing a very serious threat from serious and organised crime. And the vast majority of that organised crime is offshore. Since 2017, Phelan and the ACIC have tirelessly targeted encrypted communication platforms, 
drugs and dirty money to uncover the organised criminals posing the gravest harm to Australia. These suspected Mr Bigs are specially designated as APOTs, Australian Priority Organisation Targets. Their identities are a tightly held secret. How hard is it to get on the APOT list? It is not an easy list to get onto. It's a list that really, from our point of view, has the, those that pose the greatest threat to Australia. To put it simply, to get on the APOT list, you must be the baddest of the bad. You've got to be the baddest of the bad and um, you've got to really affect the drug trade in Australia. For the first time, we can reveal that there are 16 APOTs. Nine on the list are members of a new criminal organisation the ACIC has dubbed the Aussie Cartel, including Hakan Ayik. They are operating offshore. Uh, they're all the same nationality, Australian. They um, share supply routes. They share logistics supply chains. They share amongst themselves the doors or the way in to Australia. They share any corrupt networks they may have here to swap information into each other. What's the Aussie cartel making? Uh, we would estimate that they are responsible for about a third of the drug importations into our country. You could estimate they're probably making about a billion a year, thereabouts. We've obtained details of the secret list, and we can now name key members in the Aussie cartel. There's Mark Buddle, the Dubai-based international commander of the Comancheros. Hells Angels boss, Angelo Pandelli, who operates out of Greece. In Hong Kong, there's Michael Tu. And in the Middle East, Hakan Arif, Mohamed Bousseley and George Dib. At the top of the cartel sits Hakan Ayik, calling the shots from Turkey. Is Hakan Ayik an APOT? Uh, I won't talk about specifically who is on the APOT. You can't confirm if Hakan Ayik is on that list. No, I, I won't confirm that, Nick. Michael Phelan's discretion is understandable, but he is willing to talk about the Aussie cartel's corrupt links here in Australia, including the startling admission that there are rats among our police investigators. Are you saying the Aussie cartel has reached somewhere into law enforcement in Australia? Oh, it would be extremely naive of me to think that they didn't. Are they getting tip-offs? Um, on occasions, it would, you know, it, it certainly um, has uh, crossed my mind that um, some of the um, importations that have gone south has been has, as a result of that, but it's difficult to say. Someone in some agency somewhere is leaking, burning your jobs. I, I, look, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's inevitable. But those corrupt insider networks are not only government officials, but also private sector as well. What, yeah. what, just back on... What do you mean government officials? What sort of officials? Oh, I'm, I'm meaning law enforcement and so on like that, absolutely. But it's not just suspected dirty cops. According to secret intelligence we've been briefed on, illicit drugs are being waved through by a huge network of corrupt insiders. Even Qantas has been unwittingly dragged into this criminal activity. A national intelligence operation codenamed Brunello has found the Comanchero bikey gang and other crime groups have infiltrated our national airline. Dozens of Qantas employees have been linked to serious drug activity or organised crime. Is Qantas compromised? Um, look, I, I won't talk about um, some of the individual intelligence we have, um, but we work very closely with Qantas. I mean, Qantas are a very large employer. In a statement, Qantas said they follow all vetting procedures and that authorities have not raised these concerns with the company. But both Qantas and the ACIC do agree that new laws are needed to target corrupt insiders, the aim being to prevent criminals and their associates from ever getting jobs at ports and airports. Well, if those laws aren't passed, there'll be, right today as we speak, there'll be 225 people working on the wharf who have very close links to serious and organised crime, who are not convicted of any offences but um, have very close links to serious and organised crime and are capable of facilitating some of those doors into Australia. There's no doubt drug mastermind Hakan Ayik has earned his title as Australia's most wanted. 
But for a man with millions of dollars to spend ensuring he's never found, he's surprisingly sloppy. Perhaps his arrogance has got the better of him because we tracked him down via clues that he left on the internet. There are a lot worse places to hide than in Istanbul. It's where our search for Ayik struck luck late last year, when we received a tip-off to look at a hair clinic there. Its owner is Fleur Messelink, who likes to show off exotic overseas holidays and luxury cars on her public Instagram page. A closer look reveals many of her posts are liked by this private account at Hakan A79. I guess the first With those is, clues, we asked sources in Istanbul to find any public yeah. records for Hakan Ayik and Fleur Messelink. Turkish records show that Fleur Messelink is married to a man named Hakan Reis, who owns the King's Cross Hotel in Istanbul. On the hotel's Instagram page, we find a blurry video showing a man who looks like Hakan Ayik. We then captured this remarkable footage inside the hotel. That is him we've positively identified or confirmed. The man with the shaved head, heavy set, who we thought might be him, that is indeed him. And here's the clincher. More searching of Turkish records shows Hakan Ayik changed his surname to Reis in 2014. Reis in Turkish means chief or chairman. Knowing Ayik, aka Reis, is married with two young sons, a new name and a hotel business, we did a wider online search, uncovering new photos of the couple. A wedding pic from 2014 in Turkey and a family selfie. At his wife's birthday party, you can see Ayik enjoying dinner with close associates, including his Comanchero-linked buddy, Dax Naguru. It's an extravagant life for a man Australia believes is the biggest threat to our nation. Why on earth are overseas countries giving some of these players safe haven? It, it varies why, why some of them have taken up residence in some of those countries. Um, some of them have dual citizenship, so it makes it very difficult for law enforcement, Australian law enforcement, to operate against these individuals in those countries, and it's easy for them uh, to get to those countries. Hello. We called the King's Cross Hotel to see if we could speak with the boss. Can you please tell Hakan Reis that I know his real name is Hakan Ayik, that I know he's wanted in Australia, I'd like him to call me to discuss this. All right, wait and see. Unsurprisingly, we didn't hear back. Further complicating the hunt for Ayik, we've discovered that he's now renounced his Australian citizenship, making it harder, but not impossible for Australian authorities to have him arrested in Turkey. Would you like a country, say Turkey, to hand over an iPod if that's where they're hiding out? Oh, without mentioning any specific countries, and, and I won't, but um, certainly if um, some of those individuals are wanted on warrant, that, um, then I'd love if we followed the legal process. would be fantastic, absolutely. You'll be knocking on those doors, though. Oh, we are continually working with the law enforcement partners overseas um, to be able to make that happen. While Ayik might think he's untouchable in Turkey, back in Australia, our top authorities are ramping up their hunt for him and his associates. The Comancheros and the Aussie cartel are about to be targeted like never before. Are the Comancheros public enemy number one now? Uh, they are certainly the highest priority uh, in terms of the gangs that are around at the moment uh, for law enforcement, absolutely. You're hunting them? Absolutely we're hunting them and we make no apology for that. It's our main focus. Will you catch them? Eventually we'll catch them. I want to make it hard for these people to do their business in Australia and use all the powers we do and all the powers that we have at our lawful disposal to be able to do and um, like I said, I don't care about playing fair either.